everybody, Nichols Dingle here again for another VB.NET 2013 tutorial video. And today we're going to cover arrays and the multitude of uses and a lot of advanced features, hopefully, before the end of this video. I'm going to warn you right now, this is going to be a long one. Okay, and let's just start with a bit of a slideshow and give you a bit of background and then we'll get into the guts of it with some VB and then we'll do some more examples as we get along. So basically, let's before we begin, have a look at something very simple and something that we covered in the second video of all times, and that is a variable. All right. Basically, what you should know by now is that it's a place to store one piece of data. It can be of different types. Okay, That's not just what it can be. There's more than that, obviously. Okay, And it has a name that we can easily identify. So if we were going to visualize this, it would be a box where we can store stuff. It would have a name such as num and then we put a number inside of it. And that essentially there, this whole box here, would be a variable, just a single variable. But let's just say we want to store five numbers in total. Well, realistically, the simple answer for that is just make five boxes with five different numbers to put inside of it. That's good. We've got the same name, or very similar names, I should say. Okay, And they've got the exact same different types of values. However, it's tedious. And the biggest problem is the time to access that data because this stuff is scattered around memory. Okay, They don't sit neatly next to each other, which means the time to access each piece of data is actually quite long. So where do we go from here? Well, basically, we look at an array. So essentially, it's a set of values which have some kind of relation. Okay, And that could be something as simple as a set of numbers. Okay, a set of random numbers. It could even be something like students' marks or names of months and things like that. So let's have a look at a quick one. They have the same name. They're homogenous, which means, or homogeneous, I mean, which means all the values are the same type. They don't have to be the same values. But they're the same type. And this is what an array would look like. Okay, in contrast to what the variables looked like before, they sit sequentially together. They all have the same name but they have different values, and each one of these boxes we call an element. Okay, So basically, every single box here is considered nums, all right, but they all have different values. Well, that's good. So let's have a look at a couple more examples, because we, can't, we don't just have to have integers for our data type. What if we want singles? Let's say we have to calculate the rainfalls over a certain month, and we capture, say, eight of them. Okay, What if we want the names of the months? We have 12 of them, so we make them strings. What about if we need to know if we've paid our bills over the year? Well, there's four quarters to a year, and there's booleans. So true, true, false, and true. You can use any type of data in an array, so long as every single element in your array is the same data type, and that's fine. So basically, well, we have all these different elements. How do we access each individual one? Well, we use a thing called an index sometimes known as a subscript. okay, And that's pretty much what I explained in that sentence. Now, generally, there's our array. Let's pull it from the other slide. They'll generally start at zero. In most cases, they will. And then they'll go to the highest index. So if we have a look down here, January will start at zero, and it'll go all the way up to 11. So if we have 12 boxes or 12 elements, then it'll start at zero and go all the way to 11. Okay. So how do we access, how do we use these indexes or indices access each element, well, just do it like this. Months, that's the name of our array. One, which is the index, equals our value. And that's pretty much it. That's how you would access each one. All right, so how do you declare this array? Okay, we'll go through some examples in a second. But basically, if we want to declare our integers, which we had a look at earlier, dims num4 as integer. Why 4? Well, what we actually do, the number you put in that in those brackets is the highest index. So if we want five numbers, you put four, and that means we'll range from zero all the way up to four, which will give us five elements. Okay, same thing for temperatures, okay, that'll make 10 of them, 12 months, and four bills paid. Okay, and that's how you would go about declaring it. So basically, that's all the theory out of the way. So let's have a look at some simple examples using Visual Basic. So let's just say, I'm just going to make a quick array with three numbers, and let's get them printed onto the screen. So dim nums, and this time open a bracket, and you specify the highest index. So if I want three numbers, 
I put 2. And then you go as your data type, and I'm just going to go integer. All right, and then let's fill it with some data. Okay, thinking that the first element has the index of 0, what you do is you go nums 0 equals something. So we can go 10 or something similar to that. The one thing you can't do, whoop, I put slashes, I've been programming and other stuff too long. You can't do this. That doesn't make sense. Because what nums is, is a set of three numbers. And what I'm saying here is I want my set of three numbers to equal one number, which realistically does not make sense. So let me just get rid of that. And that's just a quick explanation to why we can't do that. Nums 1 equals, let's say, 100. Nums 2 equals 1,000. Why not? Okay, and let's say I want to print all these things to the screen. Okay, it could be easy enough for me just to do a right line. And we do the same thing again. If you want to print the numbers to the screen, you can't just do nums. And I'll quickly demonstrate what it does, just as an example. Okay, it will work. You won't get any errors, but this is what you get. System.int32 bracket bracket. So what this is actually saying is nums is an array, which is these squares of integers. That's not what we want. We want 10, 100, 1,000. So we could do this. Print the first number. Print the second number. Print the third number. And then give that a go. And there's our three numbers. 10, 100, 1,000. That's great. Now, what if we, want, what if we had 1,000 numbers? Printing all those 1,000 numbers to the screen would be extremely tedious. So let's introduce to you a nice little loop that I have not explained before in the past. This is called a for each. And what it does is for every element that's in our array, it will do our code or execute our code. So you go for each, let's just call it element as an integer in nums. And let's write the element to the screen. Okay, let me explain that in a little bit of detail by showing you the code. So there's 10 hundred and a thousand with these three lines of code. So for every element in our array, write it to the screen. So the for each loop can be really, really powerful when you get used to it. And it's just a quick introduction to how it works. But for the moment, I would really love to set up the array that we had for our months. So let's have a look at this one here. We're going to make an array of them, and we're going to get them printed to the screen as a little menu sort of thing. So I'm going to set that up now. If you want to, I'm going to stop the video and come back when I've finished this. Thank okay, you, everybody. Welcome back. I've got my array set up of my 12 months, and I've filled it up with all the data. And, well, why not? Let's just get a nice little neat menu printed to the screen. And I'm going to use just a traditional for leaf. I could use a for each, okay, exactly the same way we used it before. And I'm going to suggest you have a go at that. But I'm just going to show you a quick little for loop which will go through each one of my elements in my array. Notice how in my for loop I've got 4i equals, or 4i as integer, equals 0 to 11. Notice how I'm using the small index and the largest index in my loop. Okay, that's probably the most important piece to take away. So what I'll do is I'm just going to put a bit of spacing, put a number there. Okay, what number am I going to put there? Well, I'm going to put i plus 1. Bear with me for that one. Okay, whoops, I've forgotten the percent. Okay, and then I'm going to close that bracket and put my month on the other side. All right, that's going to look pretty complicated for the moment, but bear with me. Let's have a look at what it does. Not bad. Pretty neat. Okay, let me simplify this a little bit for you. Let me take out this plus one. All right, run the program again. Notice how it ranges from zero to 11, because those are our indexes. However, if I put the plus one there, just in that little spot, it just seems a little bit nicer when you range from 1 to 12, especially when the user, just a regular user, is not going to know that an index starts at 0. Okay, So that's what I've done. So basically, I print the start of the bracket, the number inside the bracket, the other side of the bracket, and the month itself. So if you ever wanted to come up like such a calendar for whatever reason and you want somebody to select a month, this is such a quick way to print the months to the screen. And if 
you put this piece of code, just these three lines, inside of a sub, and you can call on that any time you want. Let's say if it's a calendar program, you're going to be printing the months to the screen a lot of times. So those three lines of code are going to save you a hell of a lot of time and a hell of a lot of heartache. Okay, It's really easy to make a change if you've got an error in your code for whatever um, reason. So look, right now, all we seem to be doing is setting up arrays with values inside of them and putting them on the screen. This is going back to the old days where we were just using write line and read line. That's pretty boring as. So what we're going to do is we're going to let the user start to interact with this. And I think the nicest one to start with is let the user type in 10 numbers, and then we sort the numbers for them and we spit them back out. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just quickly wipe this code and set up our array. So if I want 10 numbers, and I'm just going to call them nums, just like before, then I want to put 9 in the brackets, because it goes from 0 to 9. And this time I'm not going to start filling up the array with my own numbers. I'm going to let the user choose whatever they want. So first of all, I always like to tell them what's going on. Please enter our number. Okay, and we'll make that a bit more obvious soon. <coughs> Excuse me. Then I'm going to put nums0 equals console read line. So we can actually use nums0, nums1, nums2, just like any other variable that we've ever used with read line. Okay. Now realistically, I've got 10 numbers. I would have to do these lines of code nine more times. But being the lazy person I am, I'm just going to use a quick for loop, starting at 0, ending at 9. And I'm going to take this code, jam it in there, and the only thing that I have to change really is this number here. Because if I don't change that number, every single time we type in a number, it's going to repeat 10 times. Every time we type in a number, those 10 times, it's just going to change the first number only, which isn't what we want. We want to change the first number, then the second number, then the third number, and so forth. So really, we don't want it to be 0, and we don't want it to be 1, we don't want it to be 2, we don't want it to be any number. We want it to be our variable i. Okay. So first of all, I reckon we should probably test this out just to make sure it works. And I'm going to chuck in what's called a breakpoint down here on this read line. Now, I haven't explained breakpoint before, so I'm going to press F9 on my keyboard. And you can even right-click and generally go breakpoint and add it. I use F9 on the keyboard to add mine in. What it does is it pauses the program, and I'm going to have a good look at what numbers is doing. So let's press play and enter our 10 numbers. And it breaks. Awesome. So let's jump down here for a second. Here you can see is our array. It's length equals 10 because we have 10 elements in this array. If I expand this, you can see each individual number that I've just typed in, which is awesome. So <clears throat> what I said before is we're going to sort these numbers and then print them back on the screen so the user can see their numbers in the set order. All right? And it's a very, very quick command to sort an array. It's just array dot sort, and in brackets you put the name of your array. So our array is called nums, so you pass it nums. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll pop my breakpoint in there just to make sure it works first. 51, 4, 92. Oh, not the 10 numbers. Let's have a look. There's my nums. Let's just expand this for a second. And notice that array.sort has put all of these in a nice, neat little order for us. Isn't that lovely? close you, you're done. And let's just present it back on the screen. So how do we print it back to the screen? Well, I'm going to use the for each loop this time. Why? Because I can, because I want to. For each element, as an integer, in nums, right line, the element. All right, what I think is probably a good idea too, before your loop, not inside the loop, but before your loop, just tell them what you're about to do. Let's tell them numbers are sorted. Let's have a go one more time. And then we'll move on. There, numbers sorted, and they're in the perfect order. 
okay, from the negative down to 945. So, that there is just some quick examples of how you can use arrays and what you can do with them. However, if you watched the previous video, we were talking about extending our student database so we can accept more than one student in the program. So, so far, I'm going to leave this code and save it, but I'm going to open up my previous project. Okay, back to classes. <clears throat> We were just talking about, we were just finishing the video, we have a student set up, we have a first name, a last name, and a date of birth for every single student, which is great. However, we only have one student working in our program, and I was just starting to explain how you could add a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth, and so forth. However, really, what you really, really, really want to do is you want to set up an array of students. And that way you can have as many as you want. Okay, let's say, for instance, I'm going to get rid of this, and we're going to make this program accept up to 10 students. Okay, only just adding them and viewing them. Nothing special, just adding and viewing those students. So basically, first of all, I'm going to get rid of this line, and we're going to do it again. So let's dim students. I like to use plurals just to explain that it is an array. And I want 10 of them, so I put 9 as students. Now here's the first problem. Before we ran into a problem that classes don't get allocated memory when your program starts. Wow, thanks Windows. Sorry everybody. And so what we did is we used a new keyword to tell Visual Basic that we want to allocate some memory to that class. However, we get an error and we're not allowed to use a new keyword with an array. Arrays cannot be declared with new. Okay, which sucks. So it means that for each student, we have to go through it and set it to a new student. And you may have already picked up what I'm about to do because I use that keyword for each student as, whoop, I'm just going to call it element as student. In students, element equals new student. Well, not create, allocate memory. All right, and we are ready to roll. However, before we begin our program, we need to be able to keep track of how many students are in our program at any time. So what I'm going to do is dim a student count as an integer and start it at zero because we start with zero students in our program. Okay, and this is going to be a very, very important number. Because if you think about it, if we start at the number zero and we go to add a student, what position or what element are we going to put that student inside of? Well, we want to put it in the first element, which is the index zero. So we use student count for that one. Once we've added that first student, we add one to student count. So it'll increase to one. And then we go to add another student. Well, where do we want to place the second student in index number one? Okay, and so student count is going to keep track not only of how many students we have in our program, but where we put the next student into our array. Now, this is not going to have any error handling. It's probably going to be very buggy, but we're just going to get it working to start with. So let's go down to student add, which is this one, and you can see we've already broken it because we deleted student one. However, as I explained before, we just made our array called student and we need to incorporate student count for our index. So instead of student one, it's going to be students. In the bracket, instead of putting zero, because that means every time they type in a student, it'll be the first student, you use student count for this instance. Okay, and this is going to be plastered all the way down, there and there. Okay, so that there seems to be pretty darn fixed if you ask me. However, the problem is view student, we're going to run into a few little problems. However, what I want to do is just comment out these lines. Just going to get rid of them. Okay, it's not going to do a single thing. But um, we're going to come back and fix that. Yeah. So what we need to do, if you just think about add student, we're adding in the first name. And if you look at the syntax, we've got the array. Then we've got the index. And then we've got the member of our class. And this is sometimes where a lot of people get confused. 
because we've got an array, an index, and then the member. Okay? The more you use this, the more it's going to become really, really obvious. And basically, by the time we get down to date of birth, we have entered in our first student. So what we need to do is increase student count by one. Okay? Another word for that is just increment. Okay? Increment needs add one. So we're just going to move to the next value, and when we go to add the next student, student count should be one. And then we go to add the next student, student count should be two, and so forth. And that way, it's keeping track of the next position for us. Okay, so what I'm going to quickly do is I'm going to put a little message just here on my empty right line, and I'm going to put number of students, and then just put student count after that. So what it's going to do is basically say, welcome, tell me how many students I have, and then give us the option to add. All right. Let's try this program out. Let's make sure it works. Number of students. Let's go to add. John. Whoa. Broken. That didn't work. Now, if you might be able to see, my for each didn't work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to go back. I'm going to have to fix up my for each. I'm going to have to change it into a for loop, just a traditional one. And we're going to have to go students i. Sorry, everybody. I was trying to do something new, and I shouldn't have, especially in a video. So John, Bob, first of the first of the first. Student has entered. Number of students, one. What about Jill, Bob? <laughs> Why not? First of the second of the first. Student entered. And you can see the number of students is growing in our program, which is perfect. Now. Let's fix this viewer student thing. Basically, our problem is, if we want a viewer student, before all we had was one student, so all we needed to do was print first name, last name, and date of birth. Okay, that's all we were doing down here. And that's quite easy when you've only got one student. But now that we've got more than one student, we, it's not a, probably a good idea to print every single student in one go. So basically, what we should be doing is printing them in a nice, neat little list. So this is where we can do a for each, okay? Trust me on this one. So for each element as a student in students, okay, I'm gonna take these three lines of code. I'm not gonna take read line or clear because I don't want to repeatedly read line or repeatedly clear, okay? But we're not gonna do student one. What are we gonna do? We're gonna do element, because we're doing a for each element, paste, paste. Now realistically what we should see is all the students in nice little blocks. Well, should. John, Bob, 111, entered. Let's add one more just for good. Let's get Jill in there. Jill, Bob, first, second, and first. And let's view them. Okay. Now, here's the snag that I was hoping to run into. Fantastic. Now, as you can see, because we did a for each, it's going to go through every single element in our array. And you can see Bob's there, or John, and Jill's there. There's our first one. There's our second one. There's our third one. There's our fourth one. There's our fifth one. There's our sixth one. All the way down to our tenth element in our array, which is all well and good. But what if we only want to display the two that have been put into our program? Well, once again, we're going to have to revert this back to a for loop. Whoop. And we don't want to go from, we can't use element anymore because it doesn't exist. So what are we actually looking at? Well, we're looking at students. I. Okay. You just have to remember that one. If you're using a for loop and your variable is I, then you make it students i. Now, we're not going to go from 0 to 9 because that's just going to spit out every single student just like we had before. What we want is every student that we have. And how do we know how many students we have? Well, we have this neat little baby right here, student count. So what we're going to do is use student count instead of 9, but we're going to have to do minus 1 on the end. Because if we have two students in our program, those two students are going to be index 0 and index 1. Okay? And if you were to read it like this, we'd be going from 0 to 2. 
which means that we'd print out three students. We put a minus one there, and we're down to two students. So let's just quickly test it. John Bob, one, one, one. Jill Bob, one, two, one. And let's just quickly view those students. There's John, there's Jill, done. That's perfect. And that's pretty much how you use what's called an array of classes or an array of objects. Okay, And this is how you make it really, really powerful. Is these indexes or indices, so whatever you want to call them, sometimes can be really complicated, but other times they can be really, really handy. And believe it or not, we're not actually done with this video. Let's jump back to the slideshow and let's have a look at another concept which is quite complicated, but very, very interesting. It is multi-dimensional arrays. Okay, right now, we only have one index, which means we can only go one direction. We only have the width on our index. What if we wanted more than that? What if we wanted height, or even depth, okay, or even more that to our arrays? We can actually have more than one dimension to our array, okay, and sometimes, Uses for this would be in games or very complicated ap applications. It doesn't have to be complicated, but it can be. So an example for a game would be if you've got a 2D top-down game, such as Pokemon, and when you move up, down, left, and right, you notice that you move in little blocks. Okay, And in background, those little blocks would be represented by a two-dimensional array, because it has length, and it has height to it. Okay, let's have a quick example of this one, and I'm going to use my own example. I have a number of students in my classes, right? And every single student has a couple of tasks throughout the year. For example, in my software design preliminary class, they have three assessments. They have their first solo task, they have their group task, and they have an end of year examination. Okay, so what I'm getting at is I have all these numbers, okay, and across the top I have the tasks, and they range from 0 to 2, okay, that's the index for my tasks. So you can notice that these are the results for task 0, these are the results for task 1, and same for task 2. And going up the side, we have the students, okay, they range from 0 down to 4. So basically what that means is that all these marks belong to the first student, all these marks are a second student, and so forth as we go across. So basically, if we wanted to pinpoint, well, how well did student 3 go in their examination? Well, student 3, examination would be that one, so they got 66 out of 100, which is average. Okay, And that's what you would use as a 2D array. Well, how do we declare something like that? Well. This is what you do. You specify the first dimension, just like we used to, and then you put a comma, and then the next dimension. And you can extend that again. You can do another comma for depth, another comma for the next one, and so forth. Okay, I'm not entirely sure what the limits are on that. But right now, I don't think I've ever gone past four dimensions. And if you get to five dimensions, I think your program's a little bit too complicated, and you need to go back to the drawing board. Okay, but how do I access each individual mark. Well, if you have a quick look at each one, it essentially breaks down to what's called an X and a Y position. Okay, If you're good with graphs, you'll be good with this. So if I wanted to know how well did student 2 go on the second assessment, well, second assessment, student 2 got 55. So we always go on the X axis before we go on the Y axis. So what do I mean by that? Well, for student 0, Oh, sorry, task 0, student 0, they got 10. Task 2, student 1, they got 71, and so forth in that particular example. Just to give you one more example before we actually do anything in programming, okay, I'm going to quickly open up Excel. All right, a lot of people have used Excel in the past, but right now you might notice that Excel seems to have a lot of cells, and if you look, that's your x-axis, and if you look, that's your y-axis. Okay, and where they meet is the data value in the middle. So the Excel program is a great example of a two-dimensional array. And in fact, it's a good example of a three-dimensional array because not only do we have columns and rows, but we have worksheets. Okay, so you can consider it X, Y, Z. 
Okay, so that would be a three-dimensional array.